Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Shreyas Kulkarni. I am the chairperson of IEEE student branch at Don Bosco Institute of Technology, Mumbai. Just a little request before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box of your Zoom or WhatsApp control panel. I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation during the question and answer round. Now, I would like to request Mr. Savir Hardkar, Professor of Physics, First Year Engineering Department, to kindly address the gathering. Sir, please. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin thanking our management, advisor, our principal, head of EXTC department, for giving me this opportunity. Thanking you for considering physics and engineering as a topic of today's webinar. Special thanks to coordinators and all student volunteers for continuously coordinating with me for this today's session. Physics, the branch of physical science which deals with matter and energy. It is based on measurements. Whether we study the big machines or small nanosensors, our concepts in basic sciences and mathematics must be clear. Physics is an experimental science and relies strongly on the accurate measurements of the physical quantities. Engineering is a branch of science and technology used to solve problems and achieve the desired goals by working skillfully. Solving problems is an engineer's inspiration. Mathematics and sciences are the creative tools to solve these problems. It is important to understand the basic principles while solving a problem. Like understanding the electromagnetic spectrum helps us to select correct radiation that is to be used. Fundamental subjects of engineering include basic physical sciences. Thus you have a course in first year engineering named Engineering Physics, which refers to the study of combined disciplines of physics and engineering. In this course, you understand the basic principles of the various branches of engineering by studying the structure and behavior of various components through observation and experimentation. Understanding the occurrence of an event through various branches of physics can lead us to many technologies. Technology is an application of this scientific knowledge for practical purposes. Practically, everything around us can be studied with physics and optimized by engineering. The thorough knowledge of basic principles will help you understand and apply many aspects of technology very effectively. Scientific discovery and technological innovation impact the world. Though we have discovered many things, there are still some challenges which are addressed by scientists. It is a matter of pride and honor for us to have one of the leading scientists addressing us today. Dr. Satyanarayana Visetti is one of the India's renowned institutes, TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. Before we proceed with the session, I would like to introduce the speaker for the day. Dr. Satya Narayana did his B.Tech in Electronics and Communication Engineering from JNT, that is Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University, Hyderabad. He has completed his PhD in Physics from IIT Bombay. Since 1983, he has been working in the Department of High Energy Physics, TIFR is currently a scientific officer of rank H. He is also a visiting professor at Applied Science Department of American College, Madurai in Tamil Nadu. His area of interest include detectors and instrumentation for high energy and nuclear physics experiments. He has worked on many major experiments, which is really incredible. This includes a series of 
underground experiments at KFG, that is polar gold fields. D0 experiment at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois, USA. And CMS experiment on LHC, that is Large Hadron Collider at CERN, Geneva. Currently, he is engaged in building a mega science experiment called ICAR, Ion Calorimeter at the proposed India-based Neutrino Observatory, INO, near Madura. Dr. Satya Narayana is a fellow of IETE, Institute of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineers, as well as IE, Institute of Engineers. He is a member of Governing Council of Instrument Society of India, as well as member of Indian Physics Association. He is a senior member of IEEE, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. He is a member of Executive Committee, Secretary and Chair of Signal Processing Society of IEEE Bombay Section. He has served as a chair for technical and professional activities of the IEEE Section, as well as Vice Chair and Executive Committee member for technical activities of the IEEE India Council. He has won IEEE Bombay Sections Outstanding Volunteer Award for the year 2014 and IEEE MGA Award, that is Member and Geographic Activities Achievement Award for the year 2016. Dr. Satya Narayana has guided and co-guided many graduate, masters and doctoral students. He has published over 700 research papers and has more than 30,000 citations to his credit. One of his research papers, partly titled as Observation of New Boson, exclusively has around 15,000 citations. He also has several research papers in proceedings of national and international journals and conferences. His very first paper won the Best Paper Award presented by IE. Besides delivering, delivering numerous invited talks, he has served on many doctoral and expert committees and university ac academic councils, board of studies, and advisory boards. He is on editorial and referring teams of several prestigious science and engineering journals. With so many credits to his name, I can go on and on. However, with this brief introduction, I request Satya Narayana sir to kindly start with today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samir. This has been a a fantastic introduction. I don't think I had ever received uh, such a nice introduction in, in my life, I can tell you that. Uh, also, what I'm uh, quite happy uh, is uh, the way you introduce uh, today's topic. And I mean, of course, you yourself being a physics professor has uh, really done a lot of, uh, I think, research on, on the particular topic. And you have so beautifully introduced, I think you made my life uh, for the rest of my you know, talk, uh, much, much uh, easier. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I also thank would thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I would also would like to thank, of course, Ashwini, uh, who had uh, initially invited me to give this talk. Uh, and always uh, thankful to IEEE student branch, to which uh, you know we are all very well connected. And particularly, uh, Sreyesh, who is actually today our uh, host. And uh, so with all that, uh, thanks. I would like to get on to, to my presentation. So I hope Suresh has allowed me to share my screen. Uh, just a second.
So can you see uh, my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, also, okay, fine. Uh, so I understand uh, the audience today are mostly very young students and mostly in the age group of about 15 to 18 years. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Somewhat. Okay. 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 15 to 20, sir. You can 15 to 20. Okay. That's great. That's great. Uh, so uh, once again, I'm very, very happy to be here and talking to you. Uh, of course, I usually like to talk in person, but uh, this is the best alternative that we have as of now, because uh, we are all you know, going through very troubled times and we are all supposed to stay where we are in our house. Or, of course, I'm speaking from my office, as you can see from my uh, the backdrop. Uh, but so what I plan for you today is uh, as the topic that is given by Ashwini, I'm supposed to talk, uh, let us say, certain interconnection between physics and engineering. Uh, but what I'm also going to kind of do, uh, you know, rather than really talking about lots of material, which of course I have on the slides, I hope I can cover part of them at least. But I think more important is, is to send you a message that I wanted to send about what physics is, what engineering is, and what the you know, interconnection between them as Samir sir mentioned about it. Okay, so you might find sometimes the slides are, you know, a bit uh, busy, but it doesn't mean that you should actually read everything that is on this slide. And anyway, I am there to guide you and uh, talk. So please focus on what I am uh, showing and what I'm speaking rather than trying to read everything what you have on this slide. Okay, so, okay, let us get going. Um, so we are today talking about uh, the physics and the engineering. Of course, uh, uh, as Sir said, you can actually see on physics, we have lots and lots of uh, topics. We will formally define what we are going to kind of say, but uh, on engineering uh, also, uh, you know, uh, typically we have quite a few, what you call branches of engineering, okay? Uh, but I, you know, right, right on the title slide itself, I have a couple of, uh, very nice quotes that I like, and I want you to also appreciate this. You know, I mean, we know Rutherford, of course, uh, by the Rutherford experiment, Rutherford model. Uh, he is actually called, uh, you know, father of nuclear physics. He says that the more physics you have, the less engineering you need. What it really means is that if you can actually design things with good physics principles, to good physics knowledge, right? Then you don't have to do so much of engineering. You don't have to use so much material and so on and so forth. Uh, many of you know Eiffel Tower. One example, now people know that for the kind of, uh, let us say the area, the height and so on, the structure that is actually built, uh, we now know for sure you didn't require so much of metal or steel that is required to actually build that. So obviously somebody did not do proper uh, scientific calculations to build such a nice engineering, uh, you know, uh, let us say the structure, right? Uh, so that is as much important as physics. That is. Uh, while we come to the engineering, we often also say that, oh, this particular thing, it is very difficult to uh, make or it's very difficult to design or it's very difficult to build you know, I can't do faster than the speed or I can't transfer more bits than the second and whatever. Uh, what, uh, this Michio Kaku, who is a theoretical physicist from US, he in fact says that what we usually consider as impossible, right? What we say something is impossible are actually more to do with engineering, okay? There is nothing in laws of physics, okay, uh, which will prevent us actually designing good engineering, uh, you know, uh, uh, solve engineering problems or build, build engineering systems. So it really, these two quotes in a way really tell us, okay, what uh, the roles of physics and engineering, and also in a way it tells us how they get so well connected. And this is obviously the theme of this talk. And what I'm going to kind of say lots of things, show lots of pictures is all hopefully centering around this particular theme. So let us get to the uh, basics, okay? Of course, we all know, uh, Sarah also briefly introduced this. We call nowadays this word called STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is very well known. 
And uh, since we're particularly going to talk about physics today, uh, we should quickly come to where we stand. Science, of course, is uh, what many of us do. We want to investigate, you know, very reasonably, very systematically. And uh, the idea is that we want to study what happens in universe, what happens in nature, you know, certain natural phenomena. And mainly what is our objective? Of course, we objective is not to manufacture something, but objective is to discover some new principles and sometimes also get some knowledge about the natural phenomena that's happening around, right? There are guys, uh, they're called technologists sometimes, you know, what they do is they try to apply this practical, you know, information, the, the laws of science, if you can say, they want to apply uh, this practical application of science. So sometimes, you know, the technology itself is a, is a good skill or a technique or a knowledge uh, by manipulating the principles that uh, the scientists actually come up with, okay? And uh, of course, obviously that's great because you're actually converting something from science to technology. Okay. Uh, now, since some of you are already in engineers or uh, you're studying engineering or some of you are probably going to get into engineering, we need to also understand a little difference between these two. While it is true that the technologists want to convert the scientific principles into something useful uh, stuff, but uh, engineers are the ones who actually, you know, achieve a very, very optimum conversion of the resources of what is actually already brought out as a technology. You know, I mean, if I have a cell phone, which is, uh, which weighs about 100 kilos, or if it costs $1 million, or if it consumes one kilowatt power, of course, none of us are going to use a cell phone, isn't it? But cell phones where, you know, it costs a few hundred rupees, maybe uh, requires a few watts of power and, uh, you know, et cetera, or maybe it can sit on your on our pocket. So that is something very, very useful because somebody has optimized uh, you know, and uh, the resources, resources could be time, resources could be money, resources could be weight or power or whatever, right? And that is where engineers really play a very, very, very important role. Uh, just to say one word about mathematics, we are not going to talk much in the rest of the talk. And since many of us, when we do science, we try to talk, we try to express in terms of mathematics. It's like a it's like a mother tongue, you know, if you were the, the mother tongue is something which we are all very comfortable because supposed to, you know, that is supposed to have learned from us. I mean, we are supposed to have learned it from mother and when we are very, very young, right? So we are very comfortable in that. So similarly, mathematics is the mother tongue of science. It allows you to express very complex uh, scientific principles sometimes with just a small few, you know, simple equations. I mean, E equal to MC square is everyone knows, right? And it actually puts in a lots and lots of uh, such science into such a simple equation. And as I mentioned already, since we want to kind of talk about physics, uh, physics per se, of course, is a branch of science, but it actually mainly talks or learns or researches about what is the nature of and properties of two main ingredients, what you will say matter and energy. You will actually see very soon, in fact, they are one and the same. Uh, sometimes, you know, depending on what you study in your engineering mechanics or you studied in school or college, junior college and so on, there are many topics, you know, that we typically study in physics. We say mechanics, heat, light, radiation, modern physics, sound, electricity, magnetism, and you know, whatnot, right? So this is, this is what uh, circumpasses in some sense, uh, what physics we kind of want to learn. Uh, but uh, before we go and dwell into more of this interconnection, I just want to kind of say this nice, beautiful thing by uh, Dr. Jane. Uh, uh, you know, depending on, you know, essentially we are kind of three kind of people that probably we are all uh, there here. Some of us have a good original thinking. Some of us have, uh, you know, some kind of innovation in our mind, you know, want to, want to improve things, to actually do something quite innovative, which didn't exist. Or sometimes we are very practical thinking persons, right? And depending on what is our uh, our mindset and you know what kind of people we are, uh, maybe we do science uh, if it are more of a original thinking guys. Maybe we get on to doing something technology, converting science into useful stuff. Or maybe we try to do engineering because we are very good in actual practical thinking nature. 
maybe optimize resources. So some of us therefore will do research, some of them will do development, and maybe some of them, some of us are very, very good in design, right? Uh, many of these things, of course, known to you because you actually uh, learned this in, uh, let us say, school. Uh, so how sometimes, you know, basic, simple scientific curiosity actually leads to fantastic applications in engineering, right? I mean, this Newton's theory of gravitation we all know uh, was inspired by a simple curiosity why objects that are thrown up, you know, come down, you know, the famous ex Apple example. And today, all this technology dealing with space and rocketry, aerodynamics, whatever, I mean, all that are actually come from such a simple curiosity, right? I mean, you can keep on asking many such questions, why charges which uh, you know attract or repel each other, right? We, we have these simple experiments that we did in school, and which of course we know because of Coulomb's law of electrostatics, all the electrical engineering, telecommunication, electrical, I mean electrical and electronics, and telecommunication engineering today is all due to that. And you can keep on reading all this, but I don't want to get onto, but I want to kind of give an impression, for example, if we know that simple curiosity, how plants inherit patterns of, you know, the traits, how, uh, let us say, leaves of uh, mango tree or banana tree or bunion tree, why they have exactly the same patterns, why there are exactly the same uh, structure. You know, this is, of course, called law, law of Mendelian inheritance, and the today all that we talk about genetic engineering, whether it is connected with humans or plants or animals, they're all coming from there. Remember this simple curiosity, sometime or the other that one goes through is all one leads to such an applications, okay? And I said about curiosity, here I talk about scientific principles. You can kind of say the same thing. For example, we know, uh, you know, so-called total internal reflection of light, if I take a, um, uh, like a like a tube uh, of a of a of a um, of a glass, or if I send uh, or a fiber, if I send light through that, it of course travels through so-called total internal reflection. The light doesn't uh, escape away, but the light that goes out tries to come back and then pass through that particular conductor or conduit. Now, this is uh, basic science principles which we all study in the first page of light. But if that is exactly what is used for the entire fiber optic technology today we are able to talk to each other because the you know what i'm speaking is actually coming to you and vice versa using fiber optic technologies uh, you know very medical kind of uh, uh, equipment that uses so called endoscopy with fiber optic devices and the lots and lots of you know sensors what we call sensors means something which will detect you know of course you may not be familiar but nowadays everything is built around sensors people what they call uh, iot right so these are all internet of things is what we say these are all built around uh, these kind of sensors now i only talked about just one row i'm telling about but you can actually see how principles like vibration propagation of uh, waves etc has led to so many fields i mean i listed probably a dozen of them and they're all engineering fields today blooming like kind of anything. Where do we get this inspiration for scientific reasoning sometimes or curiosity? You don't have to really become Newtons and Einsteins and et cetera. But if you see these things, which I've shown in this slide, we are actually talking about on the left, certain, certain things, certain birds, certain insects, certain plants, et cetera, which we see day to day in life. And on the right side, we are actually saying what they have inspired, right? We all know, you know, birds are the one inspiration for Wright brothers to build an aircraft. You know, these fireflies are something which uh, are inspiration for building LEDs and bats, of course, for ultrasonography. And, you know, Kingfisher beak is the one that helps to build aerodynamically uh, efficient, uh, let us say, fast trains and so on and so forth. We also know about Velcro, which we all use effortlessly today, but actually it comes from a from you know this uh, this particular plant called burdock, right, which sticks to our clothes, etc. Now, I mean, you don't have to look for very very inspiring uh, you know things. I mean, if you look at the nature, nature is actually providing already enough of inspiration. Here, I want to take you to really the start taking the connection between 
between science and engineering and uh, maybe physics and engineering. I want to show a few slides uh, by which I kind of show a tree that you can see. A tree, of course, has roots here, many roots here, and also uh, above, the, above the ground, of course, it has branches, it has leaves, fruits, and whatnot. I call one of these branch of engineering, which is also called branch, by the way, it's an electrical engineering, and I want to kind of motivate and tell you that people who are here listed, all these are very, very obviously famous scientists. I'm sure some of the names are familiar to you. The work that was done by hundreds of years by these top scientists, you know, many of them, of course, are Nobel laureates, right? Because of their hard work now, which is something like roots, okay, and that has kind of brought into for the tree, which are like branches, right? Now, one of the branch happens to be electrical engineering. And what you studied in electrical engineering actually comes from the science that has been kind of worked by all these guys here, which are, which I call uh, roots. So in a way, you may, you may want to say roots of science actually brings branches of engineering, right? I mean, literally your branches of engineering. I can go to electronics engineering and give you another set of engineers who actually work which brought into another branch here, which is called electronics engineering. I can go into mechanical engineering and uh, give you another list of uh, scientists who actually work to bring each and every concept which you effortlessly use it for your mechanical engineering, similarly for civil engineering. And uh, some of you, uh, probably not so many in Mumbai, maybe you have a nuclear engineering, but there are colleges where there are also a branch of engineering called nuclear engineering and here, there are many of uh, uh, scientists whom some of them probably we will also talk about them. And uh, because of their efforts, we have what you call nuclear engineering, right? So in a way, this is what I wanted to kind of also say, this is the theme of, uh, of roots of science actually leads to branches of engineering, okay? And every time a new branch comes out, a new branch of engineering comes out, a new root of science actually would have kind of worked out. Please remember that. Okay, there are some equations, don't, don't worry about them, and I don't want you to kind of read it through, but I wanted to kind of make a, a kind of inspiration to tell you this famous Maxwell, okay, some of these, some of you probably know these famous four equations due to him, which he had done long, long ago, 100 years before I was born, right? And these equations essentially do very simple equations. They'll tell you all that you are talking about what is electric field, what is magnetic field, how they are kind of connected, um, generated or altered uh, by each other, uh, by the charges, as well as by the current. You only, you only have four equations. In fact, uh, in a building here on the right side, you can see somebody was you know, so much in love with Maxwell. Uh, instead of writing something else on the building, he, uh, they actually wrote Maxwell equations on the on the building very prominently. So that is the love of people for science and physics in, you know, in particular. Uh, so what I wanted to kind of tell is this is a basic pure science, if you like, and maybe set of equations in this period. Now, when you come out to 1905, another great man, Einstein, in just one year, he was only 26 years at that time, he published four papers in one year and which are actually called Annales Mirabilis, which means it's a very, very extraordinary year, you know, that is in Latin. You don't, again, please don't read all this, what I'm saying, but look at some of them are known to us, so-called photoelectric effect, Brownian motion, special theory of relativity, mass, energy, equivalence, which we just talked about, e equal to mc squared, photoelectric effect, of course, known for known, known, known to us, all the solar energy today we are talking about, similarly special theory of relativity. But these are, for you, it looks like a very, you know, hardcore physics and very difficult to understand conceptually and so on and so forth. Yes, indeed, for, for people who, do, who study physics, probably they understand, but for an engineering students, this may be beyond their, uh, their uh, uh, what you call comprehension. But I want to show you this slide and tell you that if I tell you, look, I mean, cell phones are something which are now part of our body. And if I tell you all that happens with so-called, you know, electromagnetic waves are the ones, of course, which are used for communication for uh, between cell phones and cell towers, cell phones and cell phones. 
Now, if you say all that came about in 1962, those four famous equations of Maxwell is what brought us here. So now, where is very is basic abstract four equations, and what is this the you know this instrument that has changed our life forever, right? So that is the kind of interconnection between what we are actually talking about. As I said, theory of relativity is something which is Greek and Latin to many of us. We we don't we don't even know. We don't even want to attempt to know. But we all use GPS. All our phones have. All our cars have GPSs. But if I tell you. For GPS to work, we have to take into effect the, the correlation between you know, the time dilation, which is called time dilation. Don't worry if you don't, if you can't recollect. But point I was saying is that unless we use the principles of theory of relativity by Einstein, we would not have been able to build a GPS and we could not have navigated ourselves to, let us say, go from one city to another city or your friend's home to your home, et cetera. Because without that, you know, you will actually find for every five minutes of driving, your car will go 10 meters away from the destination. So you can see, instead of reaching something else, probably you'll reach some, some other place. I only told just two concepts. I only talked about just two scientists. And I said that how their path-breaking science actually led to something which completely changed the way we live in uh, forever, right? Of course, I also mentioned about photoelectric effect and the bear, you know, so all that today we are talking about is the so-called clean solar energy, which is again due to this man and one of those papers of photoelectric effect. Okay, so that is the kind of uh, background I want to give you. Now I want to get into a little bit uh, talking about more and more of things that we do and how they get connected to engineering and physics. Of course, many times, obviously we use uh, you know, when we talk about numbers, we always talk about whether, of course, one is a single uh, unit, but uh, if I go and say centi or deci or milli or micro, nano, whatever, pico and femto, femto is 10 power minus 15. And if I want to talk about big numbers, of course, I talk about deca, hecta, kilo, mega, mega is million, giga, 10 power nine, tera, tera at peta, right? Peta is 10 power and this is 10 power minus 15 is femto. Uh, I'm just showing you these units and you know powers of 10 just because I, I, I have tendency to use uh, these units and suddenly you might wonder what these are. Of course, uh, at your age, you are supposed to know what these are, but I just thought I should tell you. So 10 power minus 15 is femto and 10 power plus 15 is peta. And similarly, you also know what is mega, giga, tera and peta, right? Now, I also want to kind of, in case you people don't know, again, yeah, don't don't get disturbed by the what all written on this slide. Okay, uh, in case you are not aware, I want to tell you something very unique and very important about physics. Okay, uh, sometime back we mentioned about it. You know, you'll be surprised to know. So for mass, we know what the unit is. For energy, we know what the unit is. For distance, we know what the unit is. Temperature, we know what the unit is. Time, of course, we know what the unit is, right? That is what we studied in this so-called classical physics in the school, isn't it? Each one of them has different units, and we know time is seconds, temperature is, let us say, degrees Celsius, or distance is meters, or energy, joules, or whatever, and we say kgs and what, right? But the beauty of the physics that we study is thanks to these guys, Einstein, Boltzmann, and Planck, we have such a nice, simple equations. Remember I told you, maths is the mother tongue of physics or science. Just by these three equations, E equal to mc square, E equal to kt, E equal to hc by lambda, by these equations, you can actually see we are able to connect mass, energy, distance, temperature, time, they're all connected together. And I can actually talk about energy in terms of seconds, uh, time in terms of uh, kgs, and uh, I mean, whatever. Huh? So this is possible just because of fantastic discoveries of these three great people, right? Because of that, it is very easy. We talk about mass of electron, and we don't say kgs or whatever. We say million electron volt. Remember I told you what millions means and giga means. We talk about mass of proton and we say something else. We say 
one electron volt is energy and we give that in the unit of so called kelvin which is temperature and we talk about energy here and we talk about a distance here okay these are all made possible because of this great equations that we have and the signs that these three people brought in about okay it's very important uh, so of course when we see ourselves when we know ourselves what we studied in school and so on we all of course know that we are all made of matter you know either whether we are living uh, uh, you know uh, uh, entities like us you know these are uh, organism we call you know person and we have maybe one of the systems is a circulatory system we have a heart uh, you know one of the one of the one of the organ and they are made of tissues and then tissues in uh, you know which are uh, called muscle uh, tissue and that may be made by uh, so called muscle cells of course we also have red blood cells uh, white blood cells and smooth muscle cells and whatever right all this is what you and me are made of right of course the non living things are also made of matter here we call ourselves made of trillions and trillions of cells right but matter is also made of you know huge matter we have hills in front of our house maybe a table maybe a computer maybe a cell phone or our pocket right and they're made of molecules we know it's made of atoms molecules are made of atoms and inside atom thanks to rutherford we already said he he talked about having a very heavy nucleus at the center and the electrons are going around right and now is that all yeah we know no nucleus is actually made of protons and neut neutrons right and uh, when i joined tifr we know that uh, at that time in 1980s we thought that protons and neutrons are the ultimate uh, nothing else is there beyond right uh, in fact one of the first experiment i'll show you soon uh, we actually worked on uh, the so called proton decay that means whether the proton is the last entity or there are further uh, parts of course now we know that protons and neutrons made of so called quarks we'll talk about little bit about that and uh, the so called u for up quark and t for down quark are the ones which with which protons and neutrons are made up okay why did i say this i said this because knowing from what we started and some of them of course we studied all this we have studied in the schools right but maybe we have not studied all the way up to quarks and what happens beyond that but i wanted to put you in a in a in a perspective in a context to say that what we normally do when you say physics a part of physics is something what is called modern physics and this is what uh, takes you all the way from what you know here to something quite inside okay now you know if you see this picture on the left side what i'm actually trying to show you is a scale here the scale is going in meters now 10 power 26 meters how big that is right you are maybe you are about 1 and 1/2 to 2 meters okay 1.6 meter 1.7 meter tall i'm talking about 10 followed by 26 zeros that is the size of our universe and if you want to study it of course we we study using you know hubble telescope or whatever right and if you want to study what happens you know of the scale of radius of earth which is thousands of uh, uh, let us say meters we use of course as a dish you can see this kind of antennas that we have and the people like us we take a camera to kind of take a picture and if you want to say let us say dna molecule virus and you know, corona whatever it is we we use microscopes now tell me if you want to go inside an atom which i just now showed you and i told you it is nucleus and you know quarks and so on of course uh, nothing can be kind of microscopes and camera and this cannot work and this is where people build so called accelerators accelerators are these round objects in which you make particles like what you saw what you saw electrons and protons etc to to go with very 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 high speed and make them hit with each other and then you will be able to study very 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 tiny 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 particles now here i showed you what is called big bang okay and i am telling you this is 10 power minus 34 meters you can imagine how small this quantities are so man is is you trying to go from what we are today and going all the way towards the big bang and understand what happened last 14 billion years ago and for different 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 things we use different 
you know, instruments or detectors we call sometimes. So what is the main principle? The main principle is if I want to study something which is, let us say, some, some, some size, I have to use some other instrument whose so-called wavelength, you know, wavelength is inverse of frequency, should be much smaller than the size of what you want to observe. Okay, so always this is a standard principle. If I want to observe quark, which is so small, 10 power minus 10 meters, that means we use wavelength. Imagine now wavelength, energy, everything is same. You remember we talked about just now. So I should use wavelength of this energy, which should be much, 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 much smaller than this. Okay, and that is why we cannot do anything beyond this stage unless you build these accelerators. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is what I was telling you. I call this as a periodic table of particle physics. You know, periodic table of chemistry has, you know, 120 uh, probably odd uh, elements. But luckily for physics, we have only this small number of uh, elements to look at. You remember we already just now said these are all quarks, six of them. Okay, up and down, we already said which, which neutrons and protons are made of. And there are some other uh, quarks here. Uh, there is there is also a quark called top quark, which is the most heaviest one. We know electrons, of course, very well, but there is also a particle called muon, which is uh, much, much heavy, almost about 200 times heavier than, than electron, and there is a heavier one here. Similarly, there are very interesting guys here. They're called neutrinos, and actually we currently work on, on these neutrinos, very, very tiny, tiny, tiny particles. All these put together are something like you people in the classroom, but your teachers are something like the force carriers or bosons, which will make, you know, for you to interact with each other. Okay, unless you interact with each other, you, in this case, for example, unless they interact with each other, they can't make matter. So these, these bosons or the force carriers are the ones which actually make these particles to interact with each other, and then produce matter, okay? Some of them you would have seen, I have, I have drawn uh, with another ink here. Uh, I want to tell you that these are the particles with which so far I have worked in my professional career. And maybe we'll also talk a little bit later. So for example, some of you must have heard about God particle or Higgs boson, which actually Sarah has mentioned about some time back. And as I said, right now I'm working on these particles. I have worked on uh, so-called muon, and the long back when I joined TF, of course, I was working on uh, the protons, which are made of up and down or down and up, right? Uh, so this is not something which I uh, built, but uh, in fact, I was a few years old when some of my colleagues in 1965, they built such a nice detector in, in, a, in an underground mine about 2.3 kilometers below the earth. They discovered first this particular muon for the first time in this world in 1965, okay? So that is the kind of uh, contributions that India has made to the science long back, okay? I am going to say a few more things. This is the experiment you remember I told you, uh, which is something to do with protons and whether protons are the ultimate uh, building blocks that are going to decay. And this is, the, this is the experiment I built when I first joined TFR in 1983. After that, of course, I went to uh, a lab which is situated in Chicago. And uh, this is this is what I was telling you. What I meant by saying collider, okay? They are they are in which there are very tiny particles, like either protons or antiprotons, are going to kind of made to round round, you know, at a very very high energy and made to produce these particles. And then we do science. And this is in this experiment that we discovered this the particle called top quark in 1995. Okay, so this was 1983 and this was 1995. Then, of course, after this, I want to tell you a few of the experiments which you must know, uh, because these are, all of these have a lot of Indian connection, okay? Uh, these are, this poster that I made is something in which I showed all these experiments here, you can see down here, and starting all these experiments, physics experiments study what happens starting from Big Bang? You remember I was mentioning to you sometime back in that vertical uh, graph. Okay, going from Big Bang all the way coming to today, where we are sitting here, the various phases of what happened in the universe are actually studied by 
very 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 mega science you know real big experiments in which india is actually working right now and here i showed you eight different experiments and names of these experiments are all given what i want to tell you is all of these have indian connection and many of them are a good opportunity for many of you to understand how uh, physics is done how engineering is applied in all these fields and that is also a wonderful opportunity for you to go and do let us say internships go and understand what happens and maybe tomorrow you will take up a career working in some of these experiment i will take 5 minutes uh, to go through each one of them at very quickly right one of them is of course what is called european organization for nuclear science this is what sir mentioned about this is called cern and uh, this is this experiment is uh, in uh, near geneva actually it is in switzerland between switzerland and france Uh, so this is actually france and this is switzerland so this big ring that you see is very very big more than 27 km circumference and how big it is for example here on the left side i'm showing you the runway of geneva airport you can see how big this is okay of course i worked in this particular experiment here which is on the on this big ring okay this is called cern and the experiment of course is accelerator called lhc what and the detectors the sensors that we used you can see they are gigantic big big detectors right you look at this person who is sitting here there's a man who is sitting here and compared to that see how big size the entire uh, experiment is this is only a part of it by the way this is not a complete detector okay what did what did we do with such a big detector we actually discovered what is called higgs boson or it's also called god particle of course this one nobel prize in 2013 but discovering such kind of a particle with uh, so many you know events that come from that uh, so many so many interactions that happen in that big circle is a huge huge challenge we'll come back to that sometimes i call that as a needle in the haystack if you have a big haystack and if i ask you to uh, you know i if i lose a needle inside and if i ask you what where the needle is how difficult it is to get it it is something like that to get this but when you get this one event is what brings you a nobel prize right there is another experiment that is happening in uh, just now it is under construction at uh, gsi it is in germany uh, the many groups in calcutta and other places are actually part of this group it is called fair okay this is a nuclear physics experiment uh, and myself right now is involved as i told you this working on a neutrino physics Uh, this particular experiment is also very very big you can see there is a person standing compared to that how big this structure is and this is equivalent to something like a five story building okay and it will weigh about 50000 tons right you can imagine how big this detector is and currently we are working on this experiment this experiment is being done near uh, madurai which is close to which is in tamil nadu right this is another experiment very very a uh, gigantic you can actually see the structure this is being done in france this is called eater they are trying to generate power instead of fission which all the atomic reactors are made of this is called fusion fusion is what happens in the sun which gives energy and uh, you know this particular project is to try to see if you can do fusion and produce very clean power okay one experiment that you all must know is because this experiment is actually being done in maharashtra this experiment is being done in nanded okay this is a fantastic experiment few years back it won nobel prize because they discovered what they call gravitational waves which is again due to einstein einstein uh, took to this as you know in 1900s and then it was discovered only about 3 or 4 years ago It's a fantastic detector because it is actually made of long four-kilometer right angle triangle here, and uh, they use sensors which are nothing but you know ordinary mirrors. But the kind of precision that you see, if you if I ask you to measure forty trillion kilometers and with an accuracy of better than a human hair, it's impossible for you to measure. And this experiment can actually measure because. they want to find out when the two black holes merge together these ripples that are produced by that merger will reach earth and you should be able to have this kind of precision in able to measure those gravitational waves obviously this is an outstanding experiment 
and that is how it won Nobel Prize. But most importantly, I wanted to tell you this experiment is being built in Nanded, uh, where, of course, in Maharashtra, in our own state, right? This is another experiment which is in Himalayas. It is called Major Atmospheric Cherenkov Experiment. It's also very, very gigantic. You can see the kind of antenna uh, that you can see compared to the people who are uh, at this base of it. This is also a huge experiment. Another one, uh, this is being done by, uh, by my colleagues from uh, Pune. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is what is called a GMRT. Some of you must have known. And the same people are actually working on this futuristic experiment. There is another experiment called 30 meter telescope, which is also being constructed by an Indian group. Okay, so why I told you all these experiments, eight of them, as I told you, this is like a fantastic opportunity for many of you to be able to understand. And to, if you are interested in physics, there is also equally great, great opportunity if you really want to also understand how engineering technologies are used this, uh, in this experiment. Now, uh, I'm talking about engineering technologies. All these experiments use so many types of technologies which I listed on the left side. I'm not going to read all of them for you. But what I want to tell you is, by the way, on the right side is a silicon detector. Suppose, you know, you know, electronics is made of silicon material, but we also use the same material to make very, very, very sensitive uh, detectors. And you can see that actually you can't even probably see there are so fine lines here. And you can also see that there is a, uh, there is electronics also sitting here. Now, but I want to draw your attention to the left where I listed all of this, you can say optics, you can say silicon technology, electronics, VLSI, gas system, uh, magnet, superconductivity, high pressure engineering, civil engineering, architecture engineering, radiation, scientific r &D, big data, storage. I mean, you can just tell me any technology that you know today, and I will tell you that one or such technologies are used in this. I will tell you something more. Many of these technologies were not existing when some of these experiments were built. So the science experiments, the physics experiments actually made sure that these technologies are invented. And you know that is how the success of those experiments came up. So it's very, very challenging and very, very inspiring to kind of know. It's not just that. When, an, when a basic science experiment come up, the spin-offs, the, the, by, you know, the byproduct or the spin-offs or uh, you know, what it actually comes off out of that, is unimaginable. Today we talk about WWW, we cannot live for one second. Today I'm talking to you just using that technology. And this person is one of our colleagues who actually worked at CERN and why he built WWW? Because just he wanted to kind of send data from his office to the next office. Today, he didn't even pay attention to this, okay? Now today you can't imagine our life without World Wide Web, right? This is one of the biggest spin off of science, right? Similarly, we, we did what is called form computer. So instead of using just one computer that I'm using, can I connect all the, all the computers that I have today in, in my office and connect them together, okay? And then say that, uh, can I use that for computing a very, very high speed computing or in you know, solving big problems? This is called form computing, which came from science experiment. Some of you must have heard about what is called grid computing, fantastic concept. What we do is instead of solving our problems using our own computers, the entire computers in the world, whatever are there, we connect them like a grid. That's why it's called grid computer. And then, you know, the computers could be in, uh, in India, they could be in US, they could be in Japan, they could be in Africa, wherever. They're all connected together by high speed links. And then when we throw a problem to solve, we don't even know which computer in which continent and which country is actually you know, working on it and solving. But we don't care about it. This is, this is how the grid computing is happening. But today, uh, many, many, many industries, medicine, finance, you know, stock markets, meteorology, uh, you know, weather forecasting, many of the departments use grid computing as for fast computation. Okay? These are all spin-offs coming from science. I told you something about an event and I said that this won Nobel Prize because the events come as every 25 nanosecond, one such thing. How will I find out whether the particular event is interesting or not? Today we talk about pattern recognition, we talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, we want to understand video processing. 
all those principles that today we use in uh, to solve those problems were actually used in order to understand find out you know what is this interesting event you remember i said needle in the haystack when you have billions and billions of uh, you know all such events there is only one event that is going to be a nobel prize winning how will you find out that event we actually used these techniques long long back we used special computers called gpus we use special database architectures we use data mining we use visualization school all these are now become a big spun offs into industrial applications medical applications security applications and you know many of you talk about uh, all these technologies today right many of us we go to bank we go to we go to let us say atm and withdraw money we do online transaction on the on the you know on the uh, on the internet etc right and we think that everything is safe why safe because the informatics or the cryptography right all that we talk about 128 bit encryption and so on so forth all these techniques are not uh, made by uh, financial companies they're not made by computer companies they're not made by you know whatever you think stock exchanges all those principles of modern cryptography was actually worked by mathematician scientists as a pure science and today they have such a fantastic application we built a large number of you remember i talked to you that very massive uh, detectors to do basic science i think your sir has said very very nicely physics is essentially an experimental science we don't believe anything unless we prove unless we actually uh, you know uh, detect it or record it i mean higgs boson we talked about some time back the peter higgs talked about it and published paper in 1960s but unless until we discovered it in 2012 okay he didn't win nobel prize until 2013 because nobel prize is not given until it is really proven so as sir has nicely mentioned physics especially physics is always experimental science so we do lots of experiments by building detectors now how do you use those detectors is it only for us or is it also useful for everybody else yes of course they are useful one of the important thing is you know so called homeland border security suppose there is a truck that is carrying some contraband materials okay how will i detect automatically instead of asking that guy to open and you know show me we use the same detectors that we used to do signs and when the truck is actually passing by we will be able to use these particles you remember i told you something what is called muon we use those particles to be able to kind of track them and i'll be able to distinguish whether the material that is being carried is something uh, something you know or regular material what is declared or they are carrying something which is very illegal of course volcanoes are something one of the natural uh, calamities many times for us big volcanoes when they explode like this is going to call big devastation okay how will you monitor the activity of the volcanoes the same detectors that we use for signs can also be used to detect the muons the particles that i talked about coming at an angle and detect them obviously they also pass through the belly of the of the volcanoes and depending on what's happening whether there is an activity inside the belly of the volcano or it is quiet we'll be able to kind of see what's what's happening inside and i'll be able to monitor and tell you that uh, things are okay the 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 Uh, let us say the volcano is volcano is quiet or it's going to explode like this can you believe where are these detectors that i'm talking about science and how we are using them for you know human safety sometimes even archaeological surveys uh, studies for example this is a big pyramid how will you know what is inside without breaking a pyramid you can use these particles which are all coming which are all free cosmic ray particles are all there around us we can actually use them and when when these particles come through at an angle it will give you a fantastic tomography just like a photograph that we use and then we'll be able to detect what is the structure that is inside and so on and so forth right okay these are the kind of gigantic objects that i was talking to you and uh, it requires a very very heavy but very precision engineering which involves a great skills of a civil and mechanical engineers to be able to move them Uh, this this is weighing about 12500 tons and very nicely it is you know taken down in a big well like this it requires a very big precision engineering the superconductivity which was discovered as a part of uh, the science today used uh, to transfer power from the hydel power stations or 
thermal power stations to various cities which will consume less you know which will which will uh, let us say reduce the loss of power uh, as the power is transmitted in the long wires of course leviated trains which are already a reality in many countries is also due to superconductivity which is of course is due to basic science when long pipelines between countries and between continents are laid to send oil through the pipelines it's very important to understand how the water how the oil moves you know what is the kind of turbulence because if turbulence is too much you require more engines and more motor power to pull the you know push the oil inside and physics and particularly the detectors that we use called silicon strip detectors allow you to be able to monitor the turbulence and then optimize the kind of power that you require to pump this oil from one continent to another continent you can't even believe today we talk about cell phones we talk about many communications uh, through rf you know satellite communications and so on the neutrinos which i talked to you only briefly about those particles neutrinos cannot be stopped by you know any amount of matter it can actually go from one end of earth to the other end of earth there are already some experiments which today they are scientific fiction but maybe one day that will become a reality maybe neutrinos can be used to send in you know, a communication signals from one place to another place today a cell phone if you use you will not be able to talk to a person if a person is let us say below water for example in a submarine but but a phone which is based on neutrinos probably can be used very soon maybe uh, today of course it is still as i said it is a Uh, futuristic technology but who knows it will happen uh, sometime maybe when you guys really grow up and work on some of these and this is the kind of big big experiments that we work on and sometimes i call this as a social engineering because hundreds of phd's hundreds of and uh, hundreds of phd students hundreds of engineers coming from you know hundreds of institutes 40 50 countries we all work together as one team and that is how we will be able to produce the scientific result sometimes putting all this together is a, a more complex job than a corporate office okay coming to the last part of uh, the applications of physics detectors in science and but in the in mostly in the medical imaging medical imaging is what requires for the people to go through uh, you know the medical uh, imaging techniques in order to for example if a patient is suffering from certain cancers or tumors or whatever okay you you need to go through uh, this kind of uh, diagnostic procedure now of course this is this is what we generally call medical imaging and high energy physics uh, nuclear physics detectors are used in a big way uh, in the all these medical imaging technologies all the way going back uh, to x rays where different energies of x rays are of course used for material technology mammography of course medical ct and airport security where we go through the x rays are used as different different detector depending on whether it is a uh, low energy or high energy you all remember him of course he is ranjan you uh, won the very very first physics nobel prize way back in 1901 for discovering x rays right and this first film x ray film that he took off his uh, wife's uh, hand and you can actually see Uh, this is his wife's engagement ring here right uh, of course x rays are known to us uh, and uh, some of us must have gone through it essentially gives you uh, it's a black and white or a gray scale it will tell you where the bones are where the flesh is right it's something like a black and white that's all it can do but the kind of service it has done for the last 100 years is unbelievable for all sort of medical imaging but similarly for example magnetic resonance imaging Uh, which is very very sophisticated uh, technique that we use for uh, you know neurology and for also for other uh, soft tissue uh, imaging is again coming from techniques which are used in the in the particle physics and of course we, they use the same technique what we also use for building building nuclear and particle physics detectors okay there is also a technique called mpi where uh, the the blood flow of the patients is monitored uh it again uses here this kind of device uses same detectors uh, that we use for doing science of course uh, experimental physics and so on here the person is injected with a radioactive tracer and then when they, when it emits radiation these detectors are 
uh, detecting that and give you a nice map of how the blood is flowing out of heart and back in. Uh, if somebody had tumors or uh, you know in the in the in the brain, uh, this is what is called positron emission tomography. The detectors are built around, uh, for example, in this case uh, around the neck. And uh, when the person is injected with uh, radio radioactive uh, material, which has positrons in it, it goes into the body. It meets with electrons and produce these two photons. And these photons are actually the you know detected by the detectors, the same detectors which we also use in our lab actually, and give you a map of how, uh, for example, this mice here has uh, activity like this. Now, obviously, if there is a cancerous growth, you will get more signals coming from that part. Maybe you will see a more of a red here compared to that maybe yellow is better maybe uh, pink is better or blue is even normal activity. So if you can get the complete map, it will become very easy to cure this patient by let us say proton therapy. There are also detectors nowadays with, made with semiconductor detectors and it will give you a fantastic kind of resolution, much, much more than, for example, you saw an X-ray image using these detectors now, which are which came after 100 years, more than 100 years, now they're called color X-ray detectors. They can give you a picture which is completely each and every element in your body, you'll be able to get a fantastic picture. Obviously, we have come long way from black and white X-ray to color X-ray. And these two gentlemen here, I want to show not because of what the science is. This person, you know, this is called Bragg's Law. I will come to this, why I'm showing these pictures. He is, of course, father and his son. Son was 25 years. He worked with his father along with, and in 1915, they won Nobel Prize. He was 25 years at that time. What did they discover? They discovered a way by which, for example, that if there is a tumor in, in, in somebody's brain, which is discovered by, which is imaged by the devices which I told you, using protons, the beam of protons, you will be able to exactly send the beam only to the tumor location, not here, anywhere else. And then it exactly delivers the big dose of protons and kills that tumor. Remember, I don't want to kill all healthy tissues which are around. And this technique, which is now used in every single hospital was actually made possible because what is called Bragg's law, which was actually possible by a Nobel prize winning uh, physics done by a father and son. I really want to repeat, he was 25 years when he won Nobel Prize. Okay. So I told you about this proton therapy by which once the person is identified with a problem, this is the kind of gun in which protons come in and they will be exactly able to locate and cure the patient using the proton therapy. And for, for, for many of the uh, imaging what are isotopes that are injected, you know, the, the injection, they inject like a radioactive material. Those are also built in the, those are also made in the science labs where we all work. Today, we are talking about coronavirus. We are talking about medicines, vaccines, drug development, whether we already have a vaccine or not. These biomedicine and drug development for that also, uh, a lot of tools, you know, researchers use these X-ray beams, which I talked to you about and uh, dedicated synchrotrons, which we also use for doing research. And those same applications, same techniques are used because unless you understand what is the proton protein structure of various uh, you know, uh, cells that we have, you will not be able to detect, you will not be able to kind of make, uh, let us say drugs that can work on these uh, uh, humans. Okay, so uh, in order to kind of study uh, the proteins and hence develop the drugs, you again require the same physics uh, principles and same physics detectors, okay? Some of you might uh, be surprised or some of you might, uh, might be asking, how do one do this kind of research or this kind of work while we are still in the college, okay? This is the last part I want to come to. You don't have to uh, be already in a big institute or a big international lab to start doing uh, research. For example, one of the nice topic for many of you and also your faculties in particular to do is what is called mathematical modeling. Mathematical modeling refers to how you can describe any system, mechanical system, civil system, electronic system, you know, bridges or roads or big buildings or whatever. How can I model it 
using basic mathematical principles. If I can do that using that model, I'll be able to do simulations. I'll be able to do simulations on this model. And I'll be able to tell you, for example, if I ask you before even the, uh, let us say, Bandra ceiling is built, if I tell you, please simulate and tell me whether it will be able to withstand this kind of traffic, this kind of wind uh, speed, this kind of uh, tidal waves, this kind of uh, uh, you know trucks or whatever it is, you will be able to do if you can very, very accurately model this using a mathematical. And then you do simulations of various effects and then you will be able to come to and say, yes, if you build with this kind of beams, this kind of uh, pillars, this kind of uh, ropes, this kind of width, this kind of material, and this bridge will be able to withstand. So this is this is a nice field where all you require to do this modeling is actually a computer. Now, if I give you just a, a simple picture like this, all that, you know, using simulations, I'm actually finding out exactly what is the value of pi. Of course, you know what is the value of pi. But the thing is, in order to do, just as an example I'm giving, if I take a square, which is one unit by one unit, and if I inscribe a uh, one fourth, a quadrant of a circle here, obviously the area between area is a square and area of the circle is pi r square and pi r square by four is because it is a quadrant. The ratio of this will give me the, the pi, right? And depending on how many samples of simulations that I'm able to do, which are red dots here and the green or a blue dots here, I'll be able to get very, very exact value of pi. You can see these are the number of points and this is the pi value. That is what simulations actually mean. Today, we all talk about a lot and lot of medical concern and one field that is actually coming up, uh, I mean, came up already and lots of students, particularly the engineering students are working quite well and I'm very happy to say that uh, they're able to produce good results even sitting in their college and universities because they're able to kind of work on problems like, well, how do I, how do I take pictures of X-ray, chest X-ray pictures, and can I able to detect whether this person has a pneumonia or not, whether this person has a coronavirus or not? All that requires is to build what is called a neural network. This whole process is called, you know, machine learning or deep learning system. I give the the network is what it is typically shown here, and I give various inputs to that network. Network is uh, it's all connected by these wires, you can see. And uh, so depending on the number of inputs that I give, depending on what output I want, I want to train this particular computer network, what is called neural network. Neural network because it is, it is inspired by the network of neurons which we have in our body, in our mind. And now once, you know, the way we are trained when we are young to solve problems, this neural network also can be trained to solve any problems based on certain 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 given data. I already know I give 10,000 X-ray images and I know each X-ray, uh, let us say person has a problem or not. And using that, I'll be able to train it. And once if I give a new X-ray, which I have not given or not tested, and then this network is supposed to give me the output. So this is the whole concept of what is called artificial intelligence or learning systems. And that is a nice, research topic for many of you, while you are still in the college and while you are still uh, learning things, you will be able to produce really papers. I'm telling you, since this is an IEEE event, lots of conferences, now we receive papers from students who are working on, on such kind of problems. So you don't have to really come to uh, big institutions to, to, to kind of do this. Okay, so just before ending, I want to kind of say that uh, there are many nice opportunities even in the institute that I work in. Some of you, the students can come and work for summer. This is a program called Visiting Summer Research Programs. After you finish your, uh, let us say you do science or you do engineering, after that you can come and join us as research scholars. Um, some of you who want to do, uh, let us say, want to work as engineers, you don't want to come and do research here. There are also nice opportunities for any of the, of the branches of engineering that you have, okay? So at the end, the question that you ask, ourselves is when you say whether it is a physics or engineering, I would say from engineering, if you take out physics, uh, then you only do you know what you are doing actually trial and error, which means you don't have basic physics understanding, but you're building something 
working or not working you are changing something you are doing something that whole process becomes trial and error but if you actually apply basic physics principles to engineering design there is no trial and error it actually works in the first shot on the other hand if i do physics but uh, don't know much about engineering i take out engineering out of physics then you know i keep talking all philosophically everything in the air but i may not be able to produce anything that is you know useful to the to the human so uh, there is no way that i can take out physics out of engineering and phys- you know engineering out of physics so it's uh, it's very very important to kind of understand this interdependence in fact i can even tell you the, some of these examples what i gave here again i don't even know they are they should be called scientists or they should be called engineers because this man here dirac is actually a student of electrical engineering but he won nobel prize in physics for discovering antimatter this person here by name bardin we can't say whether he is a whether he is an engineer or a, or or a scientist because he won two nobel prizes he won one nobel prize for superconductivity he won another nobel prize for discovery of invention of transistor this person here who you know discovered or who wrote mathematica the program that we use all the time is actually a particle physicist this person here is a french military engineer but who actually made pioneering contributions to science of interference this person here is actually uh, you know uh, is an engineer from texas instrument who actually discovered or invented integrated circuit now i can't tell you who is who is physicist who is engineer who is scientist who is engineer it's very 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 hard so sometimes if you go to you know an academic counselor and ask tell me whether a physics is good or engineering is good you know they will say yeah yeah skill physics is good because you can study lots of things you learn many foundations many concepts and uh, you are very versatile and adaptable and so on and so forth but the problem is you require a long time to do phd post doc then only you will become academician and career path is not very very well defined and somebody will say oh engineering is really good because it is well defined i know i finish four years then you know even with the first degree i go and get a job and get a reasonable money or whatever whatever but quite often you will find out the job that you do with uh, engineering you know is not so great you know sometimes depending on how lucky you are maybe you'll get 10000 rupees per month 30000 rupees per month 20000 rupees per month maybe that's not enough maybe you have to do some more continuing education if you want to do a good future growth so i mean there is nothing like all good here all bad here or vice versa it all depends to a certain extent of what your heart say right okay because when we are born we all are born scientists because we ask questions but when we go to school sometimes we love a subject or sometimes we hate a subject so much because maybe our uh, primary school teacher one of the teacher if the maths teacher is very good we love maths and we want to do career out of it maybe we want to do research uh, if we hate biology then maybe we want to uh, take out as early as possible you know maybe when we reach the school final forget about biology then we go somewhere else right and then we say no 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 baba no no research no scientist better to go and do some employment okay and then but here if you see our founding father homi baba also had a same problem he is very much interested to do physics but his father want him to do you know engineering so he actually writes to him he says each man can do best and excel in only that thing of which he is passionately fond of okay i therefore earnestly implore you to let me do physics so he is actually writing to his father because his father says no 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 you should become a mechanical engineer and you should do but uh, of course homi baba is so much uh you know likes physics so even he has to argue, had to argue with his father to kind of do this this happens in every house and uh, but in case you are still wonder whether it is engineering or physics uh, the final word comes from albert einstein himself what he says is scientists like him only investigate that which already he is you know scientists go and discover something which is already there it's not that it is something you know it came out of the blue right now if you say uh, you go and find out the reason for it but whereas many engineers they actually create that which has never been because when you build something new nobody has built that before you actually built with your hands right so albert einstein himself uh, some of puts engineers at a higher pedestal 
than the scientists themselves. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir, for uh, elaborating the topic uh, in detail. This will definitely be encouraging for the young minds and definitely encourage them to follow their hearts and uh, do what they love. Uh, we will go ahead and take some uh, questions now. Just a reminder, uh, please uh, drop your questions in the chat box of your control panel so that we can uh, filter them and take them up as soon as possible. Okay, it looks like we have a few questions from YouTube. Um, the first question, sir. Though Indian engineers use technologies to make products, mostly all such as uh, all such detectors are imported from abroad. So how can we make them here in India? Okay, that's very, very nice. Uh, do we know who uh, this person is? Is a, uh, is an engineering student? Yeah, yeah. So he is an uh, ex uh, alumni of Don Bosco Institute of Technology. He okay. is currently working with infrared detectors and uh, for industrial applications. Very nice. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, the question that he asked uh, is very pertinent, and the answer is both yes and no. Uh, yes, because there are some uh, particular industrial applications or some particular science applications where people do import detectors, okay, because maybe uh, they, they may not be able to produce them, make them in their own lab or in their factory, or they might find them maybe cheaper uh, to import rather than making them. But the today, whatever I've shown you, today, whatever I've shown you, every slide that I've shown you today, all the detectors that I've shown you, some of them are millions and millions of detectors, thousands of detectors, they're all built in India. None of these detectors are imported. Of course, sometimes we do import materials. Some import, we import certain materials, okay? But they're built in India. All these experiments. One thing I want to tell you very, very clearly. Many of the nuclear and high energy physics experiments require huge detectors. You have seen that I have actually given you some kind of sizes and weight and volume and whatever. They require thousands and thousands of detectors. And necessarily, they have to be built with very cheap material to be built with low cost material. Otherwise, it will be very, very difficult to, you know, uh, to make it uh, available here. And, you know, you can't build uh, detectors of billions of billions of dollars and you won't get money from government. So many times we have no option, but actually to build this detector in-house in our own industry. And we actually start building in our lab and then go ahead and ask our local industry to build. Okay. so. That's why I said the answer is yes and no. Yes, of course, there are some where people do import. I agree because maybe they're they are not able to make such a precision once in India or maybe the cost is higher here. But I can I can take a word for what I have shown today. Every single detector is actually built in, India, in my group, for example. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is, so what role could engineers or rather technology play post this pandemic situation? Oh, uh, that's a fantastic uh, question, I must say. It's very, very nice question and very contextual question. Uh, I, since I didn't have much time to ponder on towards the end, I try to kind of show one or two uh, such kind of um, the works which will probably help you to get an idea. But uh, if you have gone through, I'm sure many of you are going through nowadays, a lot of media, a lot of, you know, WhatsApp messages, uh, uh, you know, internet messages and so on and so forth. Uh, there are many things, many materials, many services that were required to tide over this. Obviously, this was completely unprecedented situation, what we are facing today. Okay. People were asking about uh, software uh, devices. People were asking about uh, developing low cost, uh, let us say, masks and materials, they're testing and so on. They're asking about ventilators. They're asking about uh, some, some software system which can uh, very well work with uh, uh, to, to coordinate various agencies. And in medical field, I also talked to you very briefly, just one slide I showed you where, you know, how fast this can be diagnosed. One of the techniques is, can you diagnose a patient with corona or not, not corona, just looking at the chest x-ray? And if you just Google even today, you will find 30, 40 
different uh, companies or startups. Some of them are even with Indian students. They have been doing wonderful work only using AI techniques, ML techniques, and DL techniques. And uh, they are producing very, very good results, I must say. So there are fields in medical, there are fields in instrument building, there are fields in software technology. There are many, many fields that are open. In fact, the people are, I would say, I mean, okay, ironically, or whatever, this is a golden opportunity in some sense for people to kind of come out because this is one time life opportunity for people to kind of produce something which uh, really they can put ahead under the big pedestal. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, what step do you feel that the government should take to encourage students to take up the field of research? What incentives would be most beneficial to the students? Again, uh, maybe I should have uh, kind of shown a few slides on it, but good that again you asked this question. Uh, see, uh, again, towards the end, I try to kind of give you a feeling. Sometimes I give complete talk on what kind of research that can be done in a, in a university or in a college or whatever, okay? Uh, but today that is not the topic. But what I really wanted to, uh, I kind of gave a few examples is that you don't have to really start working or you don't have to wait until you start working on a big institute or a research lab uh, to work on so-called research problems, okay? All that is required is to kind of see what is it of interest to you what is that you are good at and what is that the world wants to uh, want you to work today? The example that I gave of COVID today is because world wants you to kind of produce research in these particular areas that I told you. About. Okay, now if you are good at, okay, that is the kind of field that you need to work. And some of them don't require big uh, machinery, big research equipment. It requires uh, maybe a, a computer. It might require a few things, maybe a visit to a Lamington Road to bring certain sensors, certain certain microcontrollers or whatever it is and build a system around. And you know, this is how you kind of get an inquisitiveness to do certain things, talk to your uh, faculties about your ideas. Sometimes, you know, these mathematical simulations, et cetera, something which are very good, very, very well can be done while you are very much part of your organization or your institute. But as I mentioned to you, there are a large number of opportunities to, for you people to work in the internship as interns in research institutes, in industries, when you are in the third or fourth years. There are many government scholarships not necessary in India, even to go abroad these days. They were not there during the time when we were studying. But these days, there are fantastic opportunities. Uh, I, told, I showed you Fermilab. I showed you CERN. I showed you some other laboratories. All these labs, actually, if you Google them, you will find that there are international student uh, internships you have to apply. Of course, obviously, you have to do well. I'm not saying that uh, you know everybody can go and do internship, but obviously, if you have motivation, if you write a good statement of purpose, if your academic career is good, and if your uh, if your supervisor uh, gives a strong recommendation, these are the things where you should go. And government, by the way, I'm telling it's not true that government is not spending money. Government is spending good amount of money on education. Of course, it can be more. It is always good to have. Uh, more on research and education, but yes, I agree 2% or GDP is very small amount, but still we are not able to use all that uh, properly. I think we, we, we have to really look up, uh, see we use uh, internet for many purposes, but there we should use this for finding out what are the opportunities. And according to me, there are plenty of opportunities for young students and even faculties. Thank you, sir. Uh, so this is a question from a geology student. As a geology student, I wanted to know how isotope dating is done to get a precise age. Okay. Uh, yeah, these are again, uh, slightly outside my purview of work. I don't work in this particular area, uh, but uh, you know, to certain extent, you know, there are several techniques. One of the most common technique of course is uh, what they call carbon dating uh, based on what carbon that you have in, uh, let us say, in a trunk of a tree or uh, maybe uh, a material that you uh, uh, that you want to find out the age of that material, it could be any other things. And then by doing a technique called spectroscopy, spectroscopy corresponds to a, loosely speaking a technique by which you use radiation passing through certain, certain material and 
the way the radiation interacts with that material gives rise to the, the particles of the signal. And if you can actually get a distribution of, let us say, the energy of that particles or some other character characteristics of those particles, that will give you, I mean, provided the entire instrument is so-called calibrated. What do you mean by calibrated? Because I get a data at the end, but the object is something similar to what I told you about learning of a neural network. Unless I understand that what kind of signal I get from what aged material, I will not be able to, let us say, get a dating or get a get a age of a material uh, using this technique. So obviously there is what is called a calibration. Okay, I need to kind of get a get a data about a known uh, material before I use on an unknown material. Okay, so. This is this again a technique which usually comes under uh, nuclear physics to a large extent, and uh, they also use many of the modern techniques these days, which is uh, very very fine and high resolution spectroscope. Okay, so thank that you. is a very very interesting field of study, both for the application as far as people who build detectors and instruments uh, to do the uh, dating. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from a faculty. Radiations seem uh, radiation are seems to affecting humans in some way or other. If neurons are used in communication, would it be having any side effects on human health? No, uh, I, I don't know if the question was uh, properly posed. Uh, the the context of communication that I talked about is not neurons; they are neutrinos. Okay. So hoping that the question is about neutrinos, I will go forward, okay? But uh, if the question is about radiation affecting humans, that becomes a different question, okay? So, okay, so let me uh, try to kind of try to answer both separately, okay? So if one is talking about radiation as affecting the, uh, the health or the, the neurons or the body of a person, of course, it affects. Okay. Now the question is, what radiation? Now, if I go and sit in front of a radioactive source which is emitting alpha rays, okay, I will die after maybe a few hours or maybe a day, or maybe even less than that, depending on what is the dose, because those uh, radioactive particles can actually severely interact with my blood cells and they can actually kill. On the other hand, I am sitting here. I, in fact, I am living here for last 60, 58 years. Around me, there are trillions and trillions and trillions of particles, which are all produced in the atmosphere. They're all coming from sun. They're coming from supernovae. They're coming from uh, other objects. But obviously, I'm not affected because these particles that you call, you know, some of the particles I told you, like muons, I told you particles about neutrinos. These are particles which you can call something like a non-ionizing type of radiation, where they pass through our body without affecting any you know, body cells. So therefore, we are not affected at all. So for example, x-rays, okay, we do get, we go to x-ray lab, we get to get x-ray because uh, obviously it is required, maybe we have a broken bone or you know, maybe whatever it is. But I mean, the kind of dose that we take is so low nowadays, even expecting mother or children or somebody can always take an x-ray film without affecting their thing. But it's not that I go and stand in front of an X-ray camera for half an hour, one hour, right? It's not, okay. So obviously one has to be aware of uh, what radiation one is in and how long one person is in and whether I am working in a radioactive facility or I'm an arm janta person on the street. So one has to take care obviously. So, but it's not that, you know, moment you hear this word called radiation, you know, that's all dangerous. No, that's not true. So one has to be very clear and one has to ask the right information to know whether this particular radiation is something affecting our body or not. Okay, not only body, even you know, even animals, even trees, even maybe many other uh, you know living organisms. Now, if the question is about using neutrinos for communication, as I told you, it is like a scientific fiction today. It's a highly futuristic proposition. But who knows? All that we are doing, seeing today, sometimes there is scientific fiction. Okay, now for this, I want to tell you something. Neutrinos are very, very, very extremely tiny particles which pass through, which can pass through. In fact, they come all the way from sun to here without getting absorbed. They can pass through our bodies, trillions of them 
they pass through our body they can pass from one end of the globe to the other end of the earth without getting stopped so which means if i can send a signal through a neutrino you know unlike a, a, a signal which i will send to from my uh, lab to a satellite and go to another one and so on and so forth or uh, from here to a microwave tower and from there to somewhere somewhere i can send straight away like a like a line of sight okay that means the message will be able to reach to the other end doesn't matter whether it is other side of the earth or below the water or below the sea anywhere i can i'll be able to kind of uh, send com communication signal but on the other hand but we are saying that neutrinos cannot be detected easily because they just pass through so obviously there are challenges to build such an equipment where you remember in the very beginning i was talking about engineers are for optimal optimal uh, optimizing the resources and so on so bringing this technology into a useful uh, engineering product will take decades probably centuries we don't know but this is a technique that has been tested and i can tell you that somebody sent a message uh, from one place to another place they using neutrinos and they were able to receive it of course with very 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 low speed but that is what everything started out so this is this is if the question is about neutrinos by coming yes sir. thank you sir uh, one last question uh, so how long do you feel will it take for quantum computing to become a reality it's already there it's already there uh, there are very successful computers been operating now in many uh, many labs in fact in my own lab there were attempts already building a very tiny you know what is called qubits qubits is a kind of unit i mean i don't want to compare directly qubits with the bits of what we use in ordinary computers but it's a building block okay so obviously uh, the larger the number of building blocks that i'm able to have maybe i'll be able to solve complex problems uh, but the 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 simple answer to this question is there already been operational in a very limited kind of um, what to call problems it's not so general purpose as of today and it is also not something which has come into so called industrial scale of things as we get our laptops or pop tops but it is already a reality thank you sir it looks like we have covered most of the questions um great thank you everyone i request dr revathi sundarajan ma'am to kindly propose the vote of thanks ma'am please good evening everyone it's my pleasure and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of don bosco institute of technology and in particular the organizers of this event first of all i would like to express our sincere gratitude to professor satya narayana for having accepted our invitation to be the resource person for this session and what an inspiring session it has been so you stressed on the importance of understanding the physical laws and the natural phenomena to discover new principles and more knowledge about them how nature can inspire us to a lot of new innovations and how fundamental research is a driving force of innovation the future engineers should understand the art of using technology to convert resources of nature for the benefit of mankind and the hard work done by physicists of yesteryears and today are the roots of a lot of branches of the engineering tree science engineering and technology is open for all types of thinkers be they original innovative or practical i am particularly happy that you talked about mathematical modeling which our budding engineers can attempt thank you sir also for answering patiently all the questions posed by the participants i hope the participants a lot of whom are future engineers have listened to your words and are motivated to explore and understand the universe better and ready to face and solve the challenges it regularly poses in a true spirit of curiosity and scientific principles thank you very much sir i would specially like to thank our principal dr prasanna nambia for her encouragement and guidance 
Thank you, ma'am, for supporting wholeheartedly this endeavor of the EXTC department. This session would not have happened but for the vision and efforts of the EXTC department. I would like to place on record our sincere appreciation to the head EXTC department, the staff and student coordinators of IEEE, IET chapters of DBIT, and those staff of the EXTC and the basic sciences and humanities department who, were put, who have put in efforts in organizing and smoothly conducting the event. Congratulations, folks. And of course, hearty thanks to the dear participants of today. Your presence has made this a success and has motivated us to think of conducting similar programs. Thanks one and all. Take care and stay safe. Thank you, ma'am. I would also like to uh, thank once again, I, I, I think I missed a few. Of course, I want to thank you uh, for this very, very nice and kind words. And uh, I'm also happy the way you kind of summarized the whole thing. Uh, it also made me uh, remember once again back uh, to again Samir sir who also made a very beautiful introduction to the topic and I want to thank uh, Ashwini once again my good friend uh, also Nambia ma'am uh, for uh, uh, this thing to made happen and apart from IEEE of course the I understand that IET too is part of this uh, event and uh, also your to the basic sciences uh, humanities department uh, which i'm sure must have played a big role in organizing this and personally i would like to thank my young friend Suresh, uh, who also organized this very beautifully and uh, i mean these are the things that we want to inculcate to the ieee community it's not just only the technology uh, development and technology uh, you know the way we kind of move forward but also the leadership and able to kind of do these things tomorrow they will make them future leaders and uh, so, of course, DBIT is always very close to my heart. And I really felt very happy to be there today, though virtually. Thank you once again, every one of you, all the students, as well as the faculty. Thank you. And also, Nambi Abhinav. Thank you very much on my part. Thank you so much, sir. Um, all right. We appreciate you all for being here. Uh, there's a small announcement. Uh, the feedback form will be circulated in your respective WhatsApp groups kindly fill it as soon as possible. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We will see you all next time. For the, the coming webinars, you can follow our pages on Instagram and Facebook. We will keep you posted. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.